Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School, the Lubar Center for Public Policy Research and Civic Education. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. Today, we're talking with Alec McGillis. He is the author of this new book. It's called Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One-Click America. This is a book about the tech giant Amazon, but it's about more than that. It's about the, the growing regional inequality we see in this country, where we have regions and cities that are economic winners and losers. We're gonna be talking about that in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, but first, a couple of words about Alec McGillis. He is a, a senior reporter for ProPublica. He's also worked at the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, and the New Republic. And he's the uh, recipient of the very prestigious George Polk Award. So Alec McGillis, welcome to Marquette University Law School. Thank you, thanks for having me. So let's talk about your motivations for writing this book. What was the story you were hoping to tell when you sat down to write this? The story I was hoping to tell actually was not about Amazon initially. It was really about, about regional inequality, about these huge just growing disparities around the country between sort of winner take all cities and left behind cities and towns. This is something I've been worrying about seeing a lot as I traveled around the country as a national political reporter the last decade or more, starting really back in the kind of the Great Recession years, the early Obama years, when I was out covering a lot of stories, uh, in, mostly in the Midwest, Appalachia, and I just see these, these towns and cities that have been hit so hard by the recession um, and in the years leading up to the recession, the sort of the first year of the of the, the century that was really tough for a lot of a lot of industrial manufacturing cities. And then I'd come back to Washington, D.C., which was then and still is now basically the wealthiest metro area in the country. And I would just be so struck by the disconnect, by the incredible prosperity there in D.C., the, the, the sort of complacency about what was in, in unawareness about what was going on in the rest of the country. And that really bothered me. And I've been wanting to find a way to write about that in a big way. And then Trump happened in 16 and sh kind of showed just what the political uh, costs were, effects were of that, that kind of growing disparity. And I thought, now I really need to write about it. And then it took me about a year to figure out the right frame, but I settled on Amazon as the, the sort of frame through which to tell the story of those disparities. Yeah, I wanna spend just a little bit of time on, on Amazon and we'll get into the, the regional inequality discussion in, in a couple of minutes. But, but I think it's, it's helpful for people to get a sense of just, I, I refer to it as a tech giant, but, but I think it'd be great for us to discuss at least briefly just how big Amazon is, the kind of impact it has, the number of people it employs, what it does to the online retail marketplace. Give us a sense of the size and scale of Amazon. It's really hard to even to describe. I mean, it's so it's so huge and it's gotten so much bigger this past year. I mean, I think we, we haven't really uh, at all really grappled yet with just how much bigger it got this past year. I think partly because we are sort we all feel kind of complicit in that extraordinary growth because it was it was us sort of completely embracing that one click life this past year that has made them even that much bigger. Um, just in this past year alone, they had to hire four hundred thousand more workers to handle this, this incredible surge in orders uh, to the point where they are now up close to a million workers in the U.S. alone, which makes them the second largest employer after Walmart. Um, worldwide, they're now up around one point three million people. Um, they have they had to expand their warehouse space by 50% this past year alone at, after already having well over 100 fulfillment centers. They've now had to go 50% above that. Um, the, their order, they were already 40% of the e-commerce market um, before the pandemic. That market, that e-commerce realm, of course, just exploded this past year. Um, some numbers I see should have them pushing toward 50% of that market. Their, their sales went up 40% last year over an already huge base. Stock was up 85% um, or so. Bezos's personal wealth went up 58 billion over the course of, of a single year. Um, so, and then that's, of course, that's just, just the retail side. Then on top of that, you have their extraordinary, extraordinarily profitable venture into the cloud world, Amazon Web Services, um, providing, you know, essentially, you know, sort of, server space to put up simply for for all sorts of companies you know from Netflix on down zoom all these companies that we that we relied on so much last year and and that that's actually their most profitable realm the the cloud realm they're also hugely dominant in that space by far the the number one company in that space and then you've got all the rest of it right the whole rest of the the, the empire the Alexa the ring doorbells um, ventures into healthcare I mean it's just it really is, it is kind of tough to get your arms around it. And you really only see it in a way, 
you see it viscerally. Um, I think in, in some ways the manifestations in our towns and communities is, is even, more, even more powerful than the numbers alone. Just when you're out on the highway now, right? And you see just one Amazon tr truck after another, one trailer after another, those sky blue trucks, just constantly you lose count if you're, if you're driving you know, on the highway or the, the vans in the neighborhood, those, those dark blue vans in the neighborhood making the constant drop-offs, the boxes in the alley or out front on, on recycling day. Um, it's just, it really, it's this sense of a company that is in some, is really in a way kind of taking us over. Um, you know, on, on the surface, I, I guess it would seem like this is just an incredible uh, American success story in, in many respects. You have this, this company that uh, uh, employs, um, as you point out, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million people. Uh, they're paying $15 an hour at their lowest wage. Um, they are, are you know, uh, creating jobs in certain places. And, and as consumers, we've, my gosh, we've, we've relied on them so heavily during the pandemic. On the surface, all of this looks like, uh, you know, uh, somebody might say to you, uh, what's not to like here? But, but is there something not to like about what's happening? There's not, not, there's a lot not to like, and that's essentially what the book is, is, is partly about, is showing you everything that's behind that, that incredibly easy, convenient, one-click order. Um, so on the, first of all, the, all those new jobs that, are, that have been, quote, created are, of course, replacing other kinds of work. They are, we've had an extraordinary wipeout in brick and mortar retailing in the last you know, decade or more, the, thanks to the kind of e-commerce revolution that Amazon has led. The job of the retail salesperson, the retail sales clerk has been the hardest hit in the country um, in recent years, just by far, even, even more than the coal miner, even more than the newspaper reporter, the retail sales clerk has just been wiped out. And so you have, in a sense, you have one kind of work that was the, the retail sales clerk who was working at the department store or at the mall or at the shop on Main Street that, that is now, in some cases, you know, literally been replaced, has had to go for work now, has gone into the warehouse to work or, or their counterpart, um, you know, counterpart in their town has gone to work in the warehouse instead because that store is no longer even here. And so you, you have in a, in a way, the replacement of, of retail work that with, with a kind of job that is much more physically taxing in the warehouse, not, and not just more physically taxing in the warehouse, but much more kind of isolating, much more kind of much more atomized kind of work where you're barely even talking to anyone during the course of the day. You're just standing there um, at your kind of pen in the warehouse waiting for the robot to bring you the this sort of stack of shelves from which you're going to remove the item and then you're going to put the item in the crate and send it on down the conveyor belt to be to be packaged. And so that's that's now the retail work instead of the the clerk that is in some way inter actually interacting with colleagues or with shoppers. So there's there's, there's this new kind of work that more resembles factory work, more resembles assembly line work in its kind of um, sort of fit more physically taxing, rudimentary, um, just kind of repetitive kind of nature, but it's also not as nearly as well paid as factory work generally tended to be in years past. So it's this new kind of work that's kind of caught in that kind of no man's land. Um, so that's that's one kind of one cost to this new new realm is that kind of um, this this whole new kind of work and and, and just the, the, the sort of unfortunate realities around it. Um, and then on top of that, you also have the erosion of, of uh, the local tax base in all these communities where you used to have retail paying taxes in the place where they, where they existed. Now you have this new, you have Amazon, which for years was managing actually to evade even assessing sales taxes because it was e-commerce and it played all sorts of tricks to sort of keep that advantage, not even paying not, not you said all these sales that so were not even paying sales taxes in states and cities, and and then on top of that now they've been very aggressive in getting tax subsidies from the places that they move into with their warehouses and data centers. So you end up with this you know greatly increased demand for services in the towns they come to, all sorts of truck traffic, um, the emergency calls to the to the warehouses, but they're not even really paying their full their full share of taxes to pay for those services. And then, and I would just say on the last example of last, you know, major cost is just something more, a little bit more amorphous, which is just the fact that, that as our lives have become so much more one click, so much more fully online, that there has been, there's a, there's a cost there to the social fabric that we're just, it, we're all, we're all now existing, especially after this past year and a much more kind of 
atomized, isolated kind of way that that is not good for any sense of you know community and togetherness and common purpose. I want to uh, follow up on something. You, you mentioned the impact on retail, and and one of the arguments that that Amazon has made and that you discuss in the book is that you know for uh, smaller companies. Um, the argument is, well, you can advertise your product here in the Amazon marketplace. This will put you in touch with people all over the world. The, the possibilities are enormous. Um, you have a, a sort of your, your reporting on that comes to a different conclusion. It's very challenging for retailers uh, to compete with Amazon in that arena. Why is that? Um, it's mainly because they end up having to um, to pay such a huge sum of uh, slice of fees and commissions to the company. And the way this works, and I and I based this part of the book in in, a, in El Paso, Texas, where I report on several small office supply companies, essentially sort of the Dunder Mifflins of, of El Paso, these small firms with 12 or 15, 20 employees that sell office supplies to local businesses or school districts or local governments um, and are very invested in their, in their local community um, you know, pride themselves on the service they provide to their to their clients. They pay taxes locally. They're all about local. And and a few years ago, Amazon came in as it does everywhere, and and did a sort of uh, two pronged thing. Where on the one hand, it went to the to the to the businesses and and local governments and school districts that bought the office supplies and said, look, why don't you just buy from us? It's much more convenient just to go on the site, just the way you do for your personal shopping. You know how easy it is, the one-click thing. Just do do all your, your business ordering from us as well. And then they went to the, the, the office supply companies and said, look, um, you should just come sell on the marketplace, uh, which is Amazon's sort of word for, for the site where the third-party sellers sell their stuff on the site. And you can just, just come on the marketplace. Your local customers can still find you there. We'll even kind of tag you as a local supplier. Um, and then you're, and then you can also sell to the whole world. You'll be on Amazon. You can sell paper and staplers or whatever to, to anyone now on, on the marketplace. It's just, it'll be smoother. It's more seamless. It's frictionless. It's all, it'll just be a win for everyone. And what that leaves out, of course, um, is that there's the, the that, the local office supply dealers then have to give up a huge cut of their sales to Amazon. It ranges between about 15% and 30%, depending on, on how much you're paying in advertising fees and all sorts of different fees. And, and so for a lot of these local companies, that's basically, it was basically their margin. And, and they felt under huge pressure and, and was started pleading with the local governments and school districts that had been buying from them saying, please do not go this route because this is gonna just essentially you know, put us out of business. And we're the ones who are paying local taxes. You were the ones who are actually here. Um, you're in, but if you go this route, you're basically going to be sending all this, all, all this revenue off to essentially to Seattle. Um, and so that's the main way that, that this, this third party market works. This, and this is now a huge part of, of Amazon's business. Well over half of the sales on the site now, on the retail site, are these third-party sales where it's actually someone else who's simply selling through Amazon on the site and then paying a huge cut to Amazon. And this is much more lucrative for the company than, than, the, than the sort of older model of them essentially just buying wholesale um, from the wholesale supplier and selling on the site themselves as Amazon. The, 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 the more specific problem that has arisen recently is which, which is what you alluded to is that now some third-party sellers find that when they are selling on the site and they have a product that's doing really well, that has suddenly become popular kind of out of nowhere, Amazon picks up on this. Amazon has all sorts of data. Of course, they control all the data. They know exactly what's going on on the site. And they are now sometimes creating their own product, a copy of the product that's doing really well on the site um, and selling it under one of their own private labels. Um, they now have a bunch of private labels where they just sell stuff directly. You know. On the site, um, and and there's and they'll to sort of pick up on that on that trend, having the data, and then sell it themselves, and essentially just wipe out that 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 third party seller, and just I mean just just they'll often just see their sales just evaporate because suddenly there's Amazon selling the exact same thing for slightly less. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you, you know, you're, we're talking about things that perhaps people um, don't know uh, about Amazon, but should know. 
Uh, what is the public's general impression of Amazon? I think in the book, uh, Alec, you, you talk about in 2018, there were some surveys that indicated that um, the public had a very positive, Democrats had a very positive uh, impression of Amazon. Republicans had a, a generally very positive impression of Amazon. Is that still the case today? Would it, would it be even more positive given the pandemic and given the, the services that Amazon provided during that time? I, I haven't seen updated numbers, but that 2018 poll you referred to is incredible. I mean, it, it was a very serious survey and it showed that among Democrats, Amazon was the most admired institution in America ahead of the press, ahead of local government, ahead of unions, ahead of higher ed, all these things that you think that Democrats and liberals sort of favor, Amazon was ahead of them. And then among Republicans, it was the third most admired institution behind only the military and local police. So yes, and, and um, this past year, of course, we've, we've become even more reliant um, on the company and, and there've been all sorts, a lot of people who maybe in the past hadn't, um, you know, sort of withheld from, from shopping from, uh, on Amazon because they maybe had some kind of compunctions about it, felt a little bad about it, were essentially given the permission, the approval of the authorities, the kind of public health authorities to go, to go fully in that route. And, you, and this past year was no longer could you shop on Amazon, not just, you, you no longer didn't even have to feel compunction, you actually could feel some virtue in doing it. And so, so that, that bond with the company just got, got even stronger. And it's a real challenge now for, you know, for people, for lawmakers and reformers who think that we need to rein the company in or possibly even somehow break it up, that you have this, a, a, a sort of mass public that is, that is generally, that has become so reliant on it. And, and this, is, this is especially important, is especially reliant on it in, in kind of blue America. So you have, you have a real rift now within the Democratic Party or within the left, the left generally, where you have you have some people, you know, some reformers like Elizabeth Warren or this young woman, Lena Khan, who has sort of laid out the very powerful case for breaking up Amazon and has now been brought into the Federal Trade Commission by, by Joe Biden. But then, so you have these reform types on the left that are very worried about Amazon, but then you have a broader, you know, sort of Democratic populace that, um, that is that is very reliant on the company and 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 very conflicted about taking it on. The company's strongest markets really are in the big blue metros. I mean, it's it's of course strong everywhere, but Walmart's still really kind of holding on in in Red America, smaller town America. Amazon is strongest in those big blue cities, and you see it if you're in New York and you go down the street and you see the boxes just piled outside of some of these big these nice fancy apartment buildings, and the doormen are overwhelmed, right? And 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 so you have you have a real, um, in, a, in a sense, you know, the Democratic Party. This is kind of provocative to, to, to sort of to put it this way, but the Democratic Party, in a sense, has become the co a coalition of what I call the Amazon coalition. It's it's people, highly educated, middle and upper middle class professionals who are ordering a ton of stuff on Amazon, especially this past year, because a lot of them could work from home, and then and then also then the coalition is also the Mostly, and they are mostly white, of course. And then the coalition is also the working class, black and Latino people who are packing and delivering the stuff to bring to them. And that's that's an awkward coalition. It's a very kind of upstairs, downstairs coalition. And this this whole shift toward the one click life has really kind of brought it brought that into relief. It, you talk a fair amount in the book, uh, Alec, about the. Uh... The, the clout that, that Amazon wields because of its sheer dominance. And uh, certainly uh, the company spends a lot of money on, on lobbying and employs or has employed people like Jay Carney, the former White House press secretary. Um, but I think the best illustration of this, and, and you spend uh, uh, some time um, writing about this, uh, is, is the search for the second Amazon headquarters and what that turned into where you had cities literally uh, falling down on their knees, begging Amazon, telling them they will do everything under the sun in order to lure them there. Um, and yet Amazon, uh, uh, you know, some people thought it'd be a chance for Amazon to uh, locate a headquarters in a town that was struggling and make a statement. And this would be a great thing. Amazon's not in that business. They made it very clear. That's not what this selection process is all about. Absolutely. I mean, they, the 20 cities that they picked as finalists for, for for what they called HQ2, their second headquarters, 
did not really include a single one of the cities that that would sort of fall in the category of a left behind city out in the in the heart of the country that could really use a boost. So all these cities that were so hoping to, to be considered St. Louis, Cleveland, Baltimore, Milwaukee, not Detroit, none of them made even the top 20. And it was just very clear that the company was was just not thinking that way at all. As, as one Nick Hanauer's and was an early investor in Amazon who is very, you know, very, very successful venture capitalist in Seattle, and he's now grown very critical of the company. And as he put it to me, when I asked him, why did the company not consider putting the second headquarters in a St. Louis and thereby really kind of helping to rebalance the economic geography in this country just in one fell swoop, he just basically started laughing. And he said, you don't understand the company at all. You don't understand Bezos at all. That is simply not how they think. They're only thinking about, you know, what's best for the company itself. And and, and so what's, what's best for the company that itself was, as it turned out, to put HQ2 in the two most obvious cities um, all along. We had 238 cities that applied for this thing through all sorts of you know, gifts and, and tax incentives at Amazon. And they ended up picking the two most obvious winners, New York and DC, the two you know, you know, true winner cities on the East Coast. And New York ended up that, of course, ended up kind of blowing up because people in New York were, a lot of people in New York were so upset about the massive tax subsidies that were being awarded. So that that Amazon pulled out of there in sort of a fit of a peak and now ended up just with Washington, D.C. So you have the city, the company choosing for their second headquarters what, what was already the, the wealthiest city in the country. Five or six of the wealthiest counties, 10 wealthiest counties are in Metro Washington. Now you're going to have 25,000 more high paid jobs coming in there right across the river from DC and Arlington, billions in investment and a whole new corporate campus. And it's just the, it's the, the ultimate kind of winner take all scenario where you have an already very wealthy, crowded, unaffordable city that's going to become even more so because Amazon went there. And the reason they went there, there are two reasons. One, the public reason was that DC has that, that high tech, high skilled tech workforce that that they want. And that's that's the way the sort of winner take all tech economy works now. You want to be where instead of just going out somewhere that's affordable, where you can get cheap land, you know, just have space, the way you might might have done back in the manufacturing days, where you could set up a plant anywhere where you had natural resources and and man, some manpower and a river or rail or highways to get your product out. Now you feel like you have to be in the place where the skilled human capital already is. So that's why you end up with a Silicon Valley. That's why you end up with Seattle. You end up with Amazon going to Seattle in 1993 because Microsoft was already there. So you knew you could sort of sort of um, draw people from Microsoft into your own company. So now in Washington, you have Amazon going to Washington because you already have that high skilled workforce already there that you can kind of draw off of. The less public reason for them going there, of course, is that Amazon, that Washington is the seat of the federal government. and Right now, the biggest threat to Amazon is not another company. It's the threat of federal intervention. And so what better way to kind of diffuse that threat than to build up your presence in that place, become sort of a, just a friendly big employer in that place. So that now, um, you know, if you're, a, if you're a congressman or a journalist or a regulator, um, Amazon is just the, the company that the guy, you know, the guy at the soccer daughter soccer game. Oh yeah, he's at Amazon. That guy, or my neighbor. Yeah, he's he's a nice guy. He's at Amazon. They're now going to have that kind of presence in Washington, on top of what was already an enormous presence because they had bought Bezos bought the local newspaper, bought the biggest mansion in town to turn into a kind of a salon space, and also vastly increased their their lobbying in town. So the, the enormous profile and presence of Amazon in Washington. Is, is a story that has not really been told. And that was one of the stories that I really wanted to tell in, in the book. So, so the larger picture here is that because of decisions by you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook, all of these, these tech companies, we, we've seen a consolidation of wealth and prosperity on a number of cities on the coast. And we've seen a number of cities in the heartland in places like Ohio and Pennsylvania and Kentucky and Indiana. Um, struggling, left behind. I was, I was struck by a quote in, in your book, Alex. I think you said that regional inequality was making parts of the country incomprehensible to one another. Yeah. Go into that a little bit for us. 
Sure. And this is what I noticed as I was traveling the country, you know, this last 10, 15 years as a political reporter is just seeing that we were growing so far apart um, in, in terms of prosperity and prospects that that there that there was inevitably just a real, real deep cultural element to it, where you where you have places that just become so wildly foreign to each other. And I think this is something that you know any of us feel if we're if we sort of are moving between the two worlds. Say you were your family came from from one place, you know, in Appalachia or the Midwest, and now you go back home to visit uh, a relative or what have you, and you just see just this really just how how just completely different that world is from the one that that you're from. You see just how how just you can pick up the resentment that 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 people you know back back in the sort of ancestral home feel toward toward the the, the hyper successful places. Um, it just that they've become really kind of alien to each other, and they have completely different problems. That's what that's one of the that's one of the key elements of this. That take for instance the housing issue. The housing issue is a just is a diametrically opposite problem in these two different places. In one place, you end up with you're dealing with blight and abandonment and depopulation and things falling apart, and in the other set of places, you're dealing with just Complete unaffordability and and displacement and and you know all the effects of sort of hyper gentrification and 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 we we don't even we've kind of forgotten that we've, we've forgotten that these problems are actually very much related. It's 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 kind of it's incredible to me that in in Washington D.C. right now, where because of Amazon coming in, it's going to get even worse. You have people struggling to afford. Row houses that now cost eight or nine or hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, and just up the road in Baltimore, we're demolishing row houses by the hundreds, by the thousands, forty miles away, and, and that's just an especially acute example of this, this 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 complete bifurcation where where because of this this imbalance, um, you've ended up with just a situation that is really unhealthy for both sets of places. It's it's it, that's the key. It's not just the left behind places that are struggling as a result of this of this disparity. It's also unhealthy for the for the winner take all cities that end up with not just unaffordability, congestion, but also real kind of loss of character and, and a kind of toxicity in their politics because the inequality within the cities has gotten so extreme. Um, but but yes, the at, at, at its heart, what, what really upset me about all this was that that political, that sense of political alienation, because where the places are are so, and, and it's such a special problem for the Democrats, really the National Democratic Party, because they used to represent a lot of these places, the left behind places, but now that the city has become so dominated by those winner take all cities, the, the voters in the left behind places look at the party and they say, that's not me, I'm not, I have nothing to do with these people. Like they, they, you, you could pick this up viscerally if you were in, you know, in Ohio in 2016, say, and or somewhere in the Midwest, and a Democratic candidate would, you know, would come, would swoop in with with their entourage of their aides and and the and the blue city media, and I would start to, I would always joke about this being a, a fancy glasses problem that you'd see all these people come to town with really really nice designer designer glasses, and the local you could see the effect that that this had on the local resident who had voted Democratic for years, was looking at these people with the fancy glasses and saying, that is not me at all. Like, that is not my party. I think maybe I'll try this guy here, even though he's, you know, kind of a loud mouth. How did you end up uh, visiting uh, a place like Nelsonville, Ohio? Before we began this, I was saying, you know, I have some familiarity with that Southern Ohio area because of uh, some family roots there. Uh, but Nelsonville is, a, a, I think, a story that that plays out time and time again in, in places like Southern Ohio or Southern Indiana or Kentucky. How did you come to to find Nelsonville, Ohio, and what was what was the, the what were you trying to demonstrate there that this is one of these left behind areas that that just is not um, in a position to keep pace with what's happening on the coast? Um, so this is actually a nice kind of nice story of Nelsonville. It's a you know town. In Appalachian, Ohio, so southeast Ohio, where the where the hills start, about an hour, more than an hour and change southeast of Columbus, uh, near near Ohio University, um, just up the road from Ohio University in Athens. And I'd already I'd spent a lot of time in, in Ohio as a reporter over you know the last couple of decades essentially, but but most of it had been in 
Southwest Ohio, the Dayton area, and also some in, in Northeast and Northwest Ohio. I'd never really been in Southeast Ohio all that much, but, but one day in 2016, a few months before the election, I, I got a, a nice note on, on Twitter actually from a young man by the name of Taylor Sappington, who was a councilman in, this, uh, in, this, in the town of Nelsonville, population about 5,000. And he had read a piece that I wrote about the struggles of sort of the, what, what I call the white underclass and the sort of down, down mobility um, in the white working class I, where I wrote in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine it was about hillbilly elegy, the J.D. Vance book and another book, but I wrote broadly on the whole challenge of the white, of white down mobility and, and a piece hit a nerve with him. He, he, he got the Atlantic in, in this small town. He had just started subscribing to it. He read the piece, felt you know, that it spoke to his situation and he reached out to me and he was an amazing young man who had gone to, um, grown up in Nelsonville, grown up very, you know, very poor and then made it to George Washington University in DC on a scholar, on a full scholarship, but it felt completely alienated there. Um, did not, decided to go back home to Ohio and finished up college at, at OU and then decided to stay in Nelsonville and, and to try to help this town, which is one of the very poorest towns in Ohio and ran for office there, won, won a job in the council, and then, and then and just you know, decided to make this, to make this his mission. And, and I did a, several pieces based in, in that area in, in the next year or two, including a big piece on the opiate epidemic there. And, and then when I came time to write the book, I decided that I was gonna set part of the book in Nelsonville in Southeast Ohio, because it just, because I wanted to have one chapter that got, got at the rural aspect of this. Um, this, this. These disparities are not only rural because they are very much also about cities that have been left behind like Baltimore and Dayton, but it is definitely partly a rural issue. And Nelsonville was just a classic example where you had a town that was once you know, quite prosperous. It was kind of like the, the market town for that whole area. Um, and, it's, and it's prosperity is still, you can still see it in these incredible buildings on the town square. And it's a beautiful town. Um, but, the, but over the years, of course, you first, you had the Walmart effect, you had Walmart, Walmarts that came in, um, sort of 20 minutes away in two directions, two different Walmarts that sucked the life out of downtown. And then you have the, the local, the one ma major local employer was a shoe, a, a boot making company, Rocky Boots. They're a pretty well-known brand. Um, they were based right there in Nelsonville and they shut their factory down in 2001. So hundreds of jobs lost there. And, and, and so now you have all these places like Nelsonville where you'd already had a loss of, of commerce to the Walmarts. And now on top of that, you have a loss of commerce to the Amazons and where your only connection to those, to that to possible connection to that new economy is to work in the warehouse that is up in the Columbus area. There are two warehouses up in the Columbus area um, that, that, they, that, that Amazon put on the southern rim of Columbus specifically because that was more bare, barely borderline accessible to this poor area of Southeast Ohio. It's where, where you could sort of draw on that desperate workforce there, people who'd be willing to come up in more than an hour a day to work, to work in the warehouses. And I focus in that chapter on another uh, you know, wonderful guy, by the name of John, who's a who's a truck driver, and he he also after losing his job in the food in, in the boot factory, decided to go to Columbus to to work as a truck driver. He's making that long commute every day, driving more than an hour to Columbus to to get to his his trucking company, and then making deliveries to Amazon. He's not a driver for Amazon. He brings the stuff that goes that's brought to the warehouse to be to be you know sorted and packaged. And and again, it's just this. That's now. The, the economy in a place like Nelsonville is really having to go elsewhere, elsewhere for work, you know, crazy long drive, um, if you have any work at all. Yeah. And, and you know, the, it's such a stark contrast. I mean, the way you write about Amazon's campus in Seattle uh, and the impact of Amazon on that city, and you mentioned housing prices earlier, but, but the campus uh, is, pretty mind boggling for somebody who's never been to Seattle or somebody who lives in Nelsonville, Ohio. The contrast is just so oh. amazing. Describe if you would, Alex, Alec, uh, the, you know, a bit about the campus that, that Amazon has in Seattle. 
oh, it's just surreal. I mean, it's, it was even for me, you know, who's, um, you know, I'm not living my whole life in Nelsonville, Ohio, but even for me uh, coming there, I was just, I was completely thrown by it. And just the, um, your, it's just this sea of brand new buildings that are just north of downtown Seattle, an area that used to be just kind of a, kind of a no man's land of, of auto dealerships and car repair lots and strip clubs. And, and now it's just been completely remade as, as this enormous corporate campus, tens of thousands of employees. Amazon now has in Seattle, uh, at least 45,000 employees. I mean, it's just, it's extraordinary. It's just the city that, you know, used to be very kind of um, middle-class, even kind of a little kind of scruffy kind of town. Um, it's just been utterly transformed, and you know, into this kind of winner take all cities, to, to winner take all city, where you now have this this gleaming campus where um, the, the one thing that jumps out at you immediately is all the dogs, right? Amazon is very dog friendly, and so you have all these people, thousands of people, bring their dogs to, to work. So you have all these people in um, you know sort of Amazon garb walking down the street with their dogs, and then you have. I, I actually was someone brought me into one of the Amazon towers where you had on the 17th story of one of these towers, there's a beautiful terrace, outdoor terrace. That's a dog, a dog park for the dogs on the 17th terrace. So the story terrace with this amazing view of the skyline with AstroTurf and, and fire hydrants for the dogs. I mean, it's extraordinary. And then down the ground level, you have a cafe that makes, that makes, that is, it's a dog cafe, like dog food cafe, where you just bring a dog in and during the day. And it's, um, and then, and then the, you know, the, the, all these kind of company bars that are, that are just have just sort of sprung up just for, you know, just for Amazon workers. It's really, and um, it's really almost kind of like a, it, it's in a sense, the feeling of a company town. It's like, it's a whole different company, kind of company town. There's the, you go to, for shopping. There's the Whole Foods, which of course is also owned by Amazon. And then there's the that's they also started out with their their Go stores there, the stores where you can go in and 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 walk, just get stuff without actually paying for it. It's called gets picked up by the cameras, um, and it's it's really it's really quite something. And then you have just beyond that, you have these neighborhoods that have just been completely transformed by that by that kind of prosperity, um, including one, one that I focus on, which is the historically black neighborhood of Seattle, the central district, um, which I think a lot of people are not, not aware of just what incredibly vital um, black community Seattle once had. And well, for one thing, it produced just an amazing bunch of musicians. Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix Quincy Jones, Ernestine Anderson, all mm -hmm. from this one neighborhood. And it has now just been transform beyond recognition. I mean, you go there now and and you cannot believe that this is Seattle's black neighborhood because um, it is just, I mean, gentrification to, uh, as a term doesn't even really suffice to explain what has happened there. But it was it's essentially inevitable because you end up with so much wealth concentrated in Seattle from this one company, other companies too, of course, but above all Amazon. And, and, and a community like that basically stands no chance. So, so let's uh, talk a little bit about the future um, and, and maybe on several different levels. Uh, so the future of Amazon, uh, is it just, Alec, continue growth? Does its dominance increase? Let's, let's set aside the issue of whether people want to break it up and break up some of the tech giants. But uh, without that, is it just, a, a, we see Amazon get even bigger and more powerful? Yes, I mean, I think that the trends are all very clear. We, um, we, we, we embraced the company in that whole way of life even more this past year. And, and for some of us, there might be some kind of pullback now, now that we're, we feel more comfortable going back to the store, but there are a, whole, a lot of people for whom this really has become a newly acquired habit. And, um, for instance, a lot of older people, perhaps who maybe didn't hadn't in the past hadn't really um, made the move yet to e-commerce, but now uh, felt the need to do so this past year and discovered, hey, this is really convenient. I'm just going to keep doing this. And of course, the key in this is that um, the more that we make that move to to the one-click life, the more that the other options fall away because they can't 
you know, they just can't survive. And then, and then, and then it's a vicious circle, of course. And Tim, Tim Wu, um, right. uh, great voice on antitrust, who's actually now in yeah. the Biden administration, he's written on this vicious circle. The curse of bigness, yeah. The curse yeah. of bigness, yeah. And, and, the, and the curse of convenience, where it, when you choose to go to Amazon, instead of going to the hardware store five miles down the road, um, because it's more convenient, eventually that hardware store goes out of business. And now your choice becomes Amazon or a hardware store that's 20 miles down the road. And so, so it just, you know, it's, it's, it, it kind of builds on itself. And so, so we are just going to see continued growth sort of in that kind of dynamic. Um, and no, I, I just, I really, I don't, I don't see, I don't see the growth slowing in the absence of any kind of, um, any, any kind of federal action. There is one, I would say that there's, there are some glimmers of competitive um, response. Um, and, and notably the, the growth of this, of, of Shopify. And which is an interesting, that's been an interesting challenge to Amazon. It's, it's, it's basically um, an attempt to give those third party sellers an option other than have, feeling like they have to join the Amazon website and do all their selling there. Um, this Canadian company that is is has been become very successful at um, helping small businesses set up their own e-commerce sites, do all their selling directly through their own sites, instead of having to go and do all their selling through through Amazon. Um, and, and that's been inter- interesting to see that one challenge kind of grow. But but you no, know, but generally, big picture, um, the the growth has just been astonishing this past year, and it's. And there's, you know, I think there's no reason to think it's not going to continue rel- at that relative, at relatively that's that same pace. Um, what about the the fate of of the workers at the fulfillment centers around the country, the warehouses? Uh, we saw the the attempt to organize a, a union in, in Bessemer, Alabama, which, as of today, appears to have failed. Um, uh, do we see? Uh, will will that be a? a um, Will that be something that we see in other places around the country? We have fulfillment centers here in the Milwaukee area. Will there be attempts to unionize or is the nature of the work and the fact there's a lot of turnover, does that discourage unionization? It makes it really hard. The, the turnover is extraordinary. And a lot of these warehouses, it's basically 100% turnover um, in the course of a given year. So just about everyone comes and goes in the course of a year, which makes it so hard, of course, to build to build solidarity, to build feeling of together. Togetherness. Not to mention that the work itself in the warehouses is so isolating. So you're 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 very you, you barely get to know people that you're working with, um, you know, during the course of your day there. So that 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 is that is a real challenge. Um, as we you know as we saw in Bessemer, it's just it's it's tough. The um, you have the turnover. You have the the company, of course, being so effective at at deterring organ, organizing, just pulling out all the tricks in the book to kind of. To, to discourage um, voters from supporting the union, um, the the laws as they're written right now in our country on on labor organizing are, are very much sort of tilted to the employer, um, and there's a bill in in Washington now to reform that, but its odds of getting through a Senate filibuster are tough. So I think what you're going to see on the organizing front is probably going to be definitely still lots of activism, lots of efforts. But in some cases, it won't be necessarily trying to actually organize, hold an election, um, as they did in Bessemer. But but um, but walkouts, sit down strikes, other kinds of disruptions meant to to continue to draw attention to to the conditions in the warehouses. Um, and I think that it, it's probably too early to say whether this the the loss in Bessemer will was a real setback or whether it was some kind of a moral victory in the sense that it did draw attention to to all sorts of um, issues you know around around the conditions of this new kind of work and and so it's it's, it's quite it's possible that it did still despite the loss um, set, set off some kind of spark you mentioned uh, Tim Wu the uh, Columbia law professor who's now an economic advisor uh, yes. to President Biden um, uh, you know, in, in his book, uh, The Curse of Bigness, which we, we mentioned, um, you know, he's ta- saying that we're living in this gilded uh, age again uh, mm-hmm. with tech companies sort of dominating. And, and you know, the prescription is to 
break them up. Do you sense, Alec, uh, based on your reporting that they're, and we touched a little bit on this earlier, but is there enough appetite in Congress to actually do something to address this? There's quite a bit of appetite, actually. And I I would wager that, that the odds of of action on that front are maybe bigger than than on the worker organizing front. You have you have a really interesting thing, dynamic happening now where you have sort of among Democrats, there's this real rift opening up between um, sort of the, the the general affinity between de- between Democratic elites in Silicon Valley. So all the Jay Carney types who kind of cycle you know, through the revolving door. Um, there've been a lot of them, you know, going back and forth. Um, Silicon Valley gives a lot of money to the Democrats and um, votes heavily Democratic. And so you have that basic affinity, but then within that, you now have more and more voices um, on the left. Um, Elizabeth Warren, many others, um, you know, declaring that this that 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 we that we are essentially in a new monopoly moment, and that we need to to do something about this. And there are signs that Biden that the Biden administration is is inclined that way, and that it is willing to is going to be taking a tougher t- tack on this than than Obama, who was famously kind of lax. Obama presided over this, you know, much you know further growth um, among the giants in his eight years. And and so between some of Biden's appointments and the fact that he was willing to speak up for the workers in Alabama, it suggests that there is gonna be a, you know, an actual, some kind of movement in this direction. And, and then on top of that, is, this is key. You also have Republicans who are, who, um, who are wary of the giants, of the tech giants. And they, can, they have their own motivations, right? It's often more about they're feeling that the that the tech giants are controlling speech and and discriminating against the right and, and um, you know Amazon recently yanked a book off of the site um, uh, after you know uh, basically in response to complaints from the left and 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 so conservatives and Republicans look at that and 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 are bothered by that and so have their own motivations to take on the giants and their dominance. And they're and they're so while the motivations are different, you could see the possibility for some possible consensus um, on you know on, on this on this front. So I it'll be of course it'll be a really tough fight. Um, it'll be um, that the the giants have such extraordinary influence. Um, they're the top lobbying spenders in Washington. They you know have all the revolving door personnel, but but we are in a sense in a 1910 moment now. Is they are the new Standard Oil, and and there's going to be so much riding on whether on, on on what comes of of this next fight. So let's end maybe where we we began, and and this is talking about the the economic winners and losers. What's happening on the coast? What's happening in the heartland? Do you see any of that changing? Will the gap uh, grow wider? Will there if for example, the tech companies are broken up. Does that help move us in a different direction? What do you see happening there? I had hoped that this past year, this awful past year, might have provided some kind of corrective in this sense that people would now um, feel freed to to really kind of go anywhere because as with the the, the rise of remote from work from home and. Um, and, and that you might see a real dispersal at last, that finally the promise of the internet that we could sort of live and work anywhere we wanted would finally come to, to fruition. Um, but, but we haven't actually seen that much of that. You've seen stories about people moving from one winner take all city like San Francisco to a slightly more affordable winter city like Austin. Um, you've got people kind of going, people who can afford to going to the sort of pretty places to live now, you know, moving to the mountain towns or, to uh, beach towns or Hudson Valley towns, um, but you're not seeing any kind of, or you have people moving to the suburbs, wealthy suburbs in, you know, outside of New York, but you're not seeing any kind of wholesale movement of people back to the super affordable um, industrial cities that, that, could so, that could, are, so, are so desperate for, for new life and, and new residents. You know, you're not seeing any kind of wholesale move back to, the, to you know, the Akron's and Erie's and and Utica's, um, and and 
as far as whether what else might allow that to happen. I mean, I do think that that breaking up the companies would they it would not solve everything by any means, but it would at least get you partway in that direction. So much of our of the, at the heart of the book is this notion that so much of our regional concentration of wealth that's so unha- unhealthy for everyone involved is connected to our is con- the concentration in our economy. It's, so that so much of our economy, so much, so many of our sectors of our economy, are now now dominated by a few by a few companies, and so to the extent that you can disperse them, just break that up, break up that incredible stranglehold and that kind of dominance, it will at least I think provide some dispersal of prosperity around the country again. Um, but 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 if short of that. I don't see any reason why the, the concentration won't just keep getting worse. You know, the companies will still keep making decisions like Amazon did when they decided to put that second headquarters in Washington. And you're going to end up with this bifurcation, this disparity is growing and growing. And it's so, so unhealthy for all of us. For a democracy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Alec McGillis, the name of the book is uh, Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America. I really enjoyed it. And we should tell people that one of the things this book does is it, it, in your reporting, you spend a lot of time with everyday Americans talking about how their lives have changed over time and what some of these larger changes have meant for them personally. So congratulations on the book. It's really, really excellent. Alec McGillis is our guest on this edition, this edition of On the Issues. Thanks very much for being with us and we will see you again next time. Thanks.